Thomas Green here with Ethical Marketing Service. On the podcast today, we have the antipreneur, Dan Bennett. Dan, welcome. Hey, thanks. Uh, happy to be here and eager to talk. Good stuff. Would you like to take a moment and tell the audience a little bit about yourself and what you do? For sure. Uh, currently, my favorite thing in the world is to develop story with entrepreneurs and business owners and help get that story where it's going. And often the vehicle that takes it where it's going just happens to be video. So when you say develop story, what, um, what's the process look like there? It's actually very literal. Um, we do some interviewing. Uh, we have some games and prompts, different things we do to kind of break the ice and get people to open up. And a lot of times it's very, um, sorry to use a buzzword, but like organic. Um, just my years of interviewing and working with people uh, leads to great questions that get people to uh, kind of open up a little bit and share. And even though business is very black and white and a lot of businesses are just ticking boxes and doing things, you know, with policy and procedure, I like to dig past that and see why uh, people are doing what they do. Do you find that people have stories, intriguing stories that will work that they kind of disregard? Because I hear that a lot. 100%. Um, one of my favorite parts about storytelling and story development is uh, conflict. And a lot of businesses and business owners stay away from conflict. They want to talk about features and benefits. And that's all understandable for sure. Uh, but sometimes when you dig past that and show a little bit of dirt under the rug or, you know, air a little bit of dirty laundry, talk about the actual problem you're solving, a uh, story seems to kind of creep out and people have really cool reasons for doing what they do. Is that like the, um, the before and after examples? Yeah. Um, sometimes it's life too. Um, it's, the reason that maybe a CEO gets out of bed in the morning and they never talk about that. And it's not part of the messaging for the company, but maybe it should be because once we discover it, it's really powerful. So it, it goes in a lot of different directions. So what's the story you use? Story I use. Um, I, when I say I like, use, that sounds a bit, um, <laughs> that sounds a bit negative. I didn't mean it like that. Oh no, they're, they're all tools um, for sure. So I, I use the word use quite a bit myself. Um, I kind of, envision myself like a big crowbar. People are doing really cool things in real life already. Um, they don't need me to create any story for them. I'm just pulling it out, dusting it off and putting a spotlight on it. And I feel like that's just kind of being a crowbar and leveraging them to get a little bit of traction to continue doing what they're doing, but maybe have a little bit more of a digital audience paying attention to it. Um, the story for myself I use all the time is like, I'm just an old school guy. I like vintage things. I like things that were built really well and last a long time. I like denim and cotton and leather boots and motorcycles and stuff like that, you know? So my story is always just trying to take like old school principles, uh, things like story that are ancient and powerful and use them in a new kind of, you know, digital format. Well, um, yeah, a couple of things there that I wanted to talk to you about. One of which is, um, is it right that you've done some work for Harley Davidson? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hence the motorcycles, right? Uh, that was a super fun job. I got to work uh, directly with their marketing department um, and do some commercial work for one of their larger dealerships. And my favorite part of that whole story, even though the work turned out really well um, and it was fun to do, is that I got access to all of their marketing assets at the like employee level. So I got to go into their servers and pull assets that were created, you know, specifically by that brand. And it was just cool to see how a big company, you know, utilizes color and font and story in their own work. Any learnings or principles that you, um, you got from that job or that client? Yeah. Um, it doesn't matter that they're big. I, I think that was kind of my first dose of we're just people working with other people trying to tell a story. Uh, that particular one, I think one of the um, Captain America movies was coming out and there was some Harley Davidson ad placement in it and they were trying to hit that kind of uh, young 30s crowd that might be looking at buying a smaller motorcycle for the first time. And they're just trying to tell the story that, uh, you know, you don't have to be uh, middle-aged and wealthy to own a bike. They have cheaper, smaller models and you can be part of the culture. So it's just fun to kind of dig in and see that these are just people trying to tell a story like anyone else. It's a cool, um, it's a cool story. The, um, the vintage stuff that you talked about, why is it that you think that you like vintage products? I've actually thought about that quite a bit and I don't have an answer, but I love talking about it because I'm always trying to discover. I know as I've picked it apart over the years, uh, a decent part of it is um, 
a lot of this stuff was just built well and lasts a long time. And I love knowing that I'm that kind of person. I'm someone who's, you know, uh, trustworthy and reliable and kind of old school and I'll come and help you move for beer and pizza, you know, that sort of thing. Um, as some of it just speaks to me because a lot of it existed before I did. Um, so part of storytelling is looking into the past and pulling information and data from people who might not be around anymore. And that includes some of those companies and individuals who built those kinds of things. Um, I'm also a boot guy and, you know, I've paid, um, higher amounts for boots than the average person does. Um, and then just got them resold and rehealed three or four times over 10 years because they just kept lasting. And I just, I don't know, there's something about that that speaks to me. Yeah, I can, um, I can imagine it being a little bit more difficult to get story from, you know, this has been mass produced and was built in a few minutes versus someone's crafted and their expertise. And, you know, there's this long history behind it. And I can see, I can see the, the story behind that part of it. Do you think that has something to do with it? I think so. Yeah. There's always a history. Um, you know, one of my accidental favorite sayings is that, you know, I've been on the planet for 40 years and not a single other person has lived a moment of my life, which means I get to tell my story. It's, it's important. It's unique. It's mine and no one else has it. And even newer companies I work with startups and stuff like that, uh, the founders have a past that they're pulling from, maybe other companies they've started or worked for, um, their personal lives, struggles maybe they had or things they've overcome, the knowledge that they're bringing into maybe a new environment or a new startup. So there's always something and it's super cliche, but I often kind of joke that making cliches matter is part of my career. Um, but just digging one layer deeper, like an onion, just pulling another layer. You don't always have to get to the core, but if you talk to someone and then pull a couple of those layers off, oftentimes you find some real cool stories that have nothing to do with the widget that that company might sell. So do you find, have you done like tests and stuff in relationship to um, uh, telling a story versus not telling a story and how that influences response? Uh, I haven't personally. I love looking into that stuff and researching that kind of information. Um, my favorite business books are the ones that are built on like research and data and stuff like that. Cause I just like knowing how people work. Uh, so again, I haven't done that research myself, but knowing the power of story, I kind of launched this portion of my career, um, not wanting to work with any companies or any individuals who didn't care about story because anyone can make your content and, and I can give you referrals. <laughs> but um, if you really care about story, that's where I come in. Um, so would love to say if the audience has, you know, any information or wants to follow up with me and, and let me know where I can learn even more about that. Um, I'm always a student when it comes to story versus just putting stuff out there. Mm. So what's a typical inquiry look like for you? Um, definitely referral based, um, 95 plus percent of my traffic is warm, uh, being on shows with uh, people like yourself and just kind of sharing what I do and opening up the conversation about story. Um, it's almost always warm traffic and it's people like, you know, I've been either creating content, not getting traction, or I don't care as much about the like click through rate and that kind of digital ROI. I want to make more of an impact on the audience I have. Those are the general inquiries. Um, and then a portion because video is often the vehicle that takes the story where it's going. A portion of the work I do is just getting entrepreneurs and business owners from zero to being on video themselves. And we help them learn how to do video themselves so they don't have to hire a production company every time they want to make a piece of video content. And those two kind of marry. Um, so it's usually someone wanting to tell a better story and oftentimes put out video to tell that story on their behalf. Would you say it's accurate that um, you focus more on quality than quantity? Yeah, 100%. And that doesn't always mean um, Hollywood blockbuster. You know what I mean? It's super important to be able to hear you well. It's super important that the main subject is in focus and we know what's going on. Um, but a really fun distinction between and this is just my personal opinion between video production and then the work I've done like in the film world is I feel like film is really driven by dialogue, narrative and story, even documentaries and stuff like that, which are awesome. And then video oftentimes is driven by eliminating distractions. We want to make it as clear as possible because you only got a certain amount of time for someone to hear what you're up to, what you're selling, who you are. And oftentimes that's as simple as a decent microphone being in focus and a couple of lights, but that quality does matter.
Um, everyone is getting used to streaming and Netflix and YouTube uh, producers like myself who put out really great quality content. People are getting used to it. So when the quality is bad, sometimes people would turn away just because subconsciously they're like, oh, this isn't professional or good. Um, so the, the quality doesn't have to be, you know, special effects and explosions, but it's, it's gotta be there for sure. So, um, your film experience, you want to talk about, about that a bit? Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, it was brief, but intense. Um, I was on my first feature length film set in 2014, I believe it was, um, spent about three and a half months on set. I was on the camera crew and I was, a, a camera assistant. So that's usually the person who's uh, pulling focus during the shots, running around, making sure batteries are charged up and that all that stuff is ready to go. Um, but I was older than a lot of the crew members. So a lot of people were looking to me for my experience in video while I was brand new kind of in the film world. And it was really fun to meet those creative people. I think the, the biggest impact of that first film I was on was two things really. One, um, it, it was a skeleton crew, but it was still like 30 people all doing their own thing at the same time and it working together. And that was the first time I ever really got to see, you know, all the, the cogs and wheels and belts driving something like that. So that was really life changing. And then the other part was about halfway through, uh, we were having lunch and everyone was just sharing something that they thought no one in the group might know. And when it got to me, I said, well, this is my first film set I've ever been on. And the people were shocked. And it's not because I'm awesome. It's just because I'm a great student. I was older, got a fair amount of life experience. Plus, I've been around cameras for a while. Uh, so I just put my head down, learned and executed. And it was just kind of fun to know that I could like jump into an environment like that. Um, and then it led to doing all the special effects on the film, because one day on set, I was just overhearing a conversation about how their special effects artist might not be able to do the job they said they could do. And I was like, Hey, if you ever need any help, let me know. And then that led to actually creating the trailer for the film, uh, which was the first time I ever did a trailer. So there was so many firsts <laughs> in that first experience <laughs> and it was just really fun um, using my experience in life to do something brand new. And I love telling that story because there's so many people out there who might not think they have a great story or might not feel comfortable getting on camera yet but they have tons of experience and knowledge and expertise that the world's waiting to hear. So I like to encourage people that, you know, even though it's your first time doing something, you could probably still do pretty well at it. So do you see yourself going back to something like that or were you a bit swamped with, with work? I, I get teased every now and then. It's not a desire of mine to be uh, in the film world full time or, you know, in Hollywood or anything like that. Um, but because of some of those experiences and subsequent experiences, I've done some work, and it seems to pop up every couple years, every year or two. Um, last year I did some work, or uh, late 2019, I'm sorry, did some work with Westbrook Productions, which is Will Smith's company. And their son, Jaden Smith, was in Flint, Michigan, where I'm from, doing some really great work around the water crisis and trying to help out the community. And I got hired by them to do some pickup shots and interviews and stuff for a documentary they were shooting. And it was fun to kind of dabble in that world again, you know, where it's all about production and where it's going to play and film festivals and all that kind of stuff. Um, don't think I'd want to be there full time, but it's fun to get called on every once in a while. Well, it kind of, um, it works with that industry, doesn't it? Because that's, that's not a, you don't get safe nine to five often with that kind of, kind of industry. Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, it's pure entrepreneurship. Um, you know, you have a vision, you get people to fund that vision, you end up with a bunch of people on set who don't always work together, they're individuals, but they all have to work on a team. So it's like a startup, <laughs> you have deadlines and goals, and you got to pay those investors back. Uh, and then there's the let's hope the audience likes it, you know, because we put a lot of work in here. So I almost view every like commercial or music video or film I've ever been associated with as like a little mini startup. Well, talking of startups, um, how did your business get started? Um, I have an engineering background and hated it. Uh, I was good at drafting and design, but never, ever liked it. <laughs> and in my early 20s, I um, finally left that industry and started kind of poking around at, you know, the questions that you usually ask before you go to college, which is what do I want to do? Who am I? That sort of thing. And I was in a band that toured at the time and I was uh, picking up some merchandise, some t-shirts that we were selling at shows. And the guy that owned the company was like, hey, uh, you guys sell a lot of 
t-shirts and i'm like yeah that's how we support ourselves so we're we're really good at the sales of the merch because we got to keep gas in the van you know and he's like do you know any other bands um that you play with often and i'm like actually yeah and he's like well if you ever bring in any merch orders for them i'll give you 10 percent and that was kind of my first introduction into wow i can use my design skills and my storytelling skills for someone else to make a little bit of money and it started to kind of snowball from there i did all of our stuff. So web promotion, posters, merch design, printing, all that stuff. And it kind of was my first accidental uh, company, if you will, even though it was just me as a freelancer. Um, so I, I liked that it wasn't planned. You know what I mean? A lot of people are like, I'm going to quit my job and go into business. And there's a lot of hiccups that can come along the way where you get caught up on like, I have to have a business plan and how do I do this? And mine was more of like, I don't know, let's roll with this. <laughs> so <laughs> I look back on it fondly for sure. So what happens after that? I uh, continue to work for that company. Actually, I came back, did more and more prints. And then one day I was like, hey, do you care if I design uh, for these other bands too and just bring you the artwork? And then it progressed to me actually getting the the film that you print on and printing the artwork on the film. And he was so excited to have ready to go film to burn screens with that. I walked in one day, uh, just to put in an order like I'd done many times before. <laughs> and he's like, Hey, you want a job? I'm like, actually right now I'm looking, I'm trying to discover what I want in life. So yeah, I'll work with you. And I uh, became the head of their art department and started working with all kinds of companies, um, not only designing shirts and stuff, but really learning how to use design and storytelling, you know, for something as simple as a, uh, Cub Scout leaders pack shirts or whatever, you know, to um, not only bring some happiness into someone's world, but also tell a story through that design. So that's when professionally I started using design and storytelling to kind of make a living. And then from there, I worked for a production company. Um, I was one of three, learned a ton in about a year and a half, and then broke out on my own in uh, 2014 and haven't looked back since. So you were. Uh... You were doing a job, uh, what you currently do, video production, or I suppose it's it's similar, I suppose. And then um, did you go into video production or was it straight into course type um, work? Yeah, definitely, definitely started with video production. So uh, leaving the art director job and going to a production company, um, I brought my art experience and we were doing a lot of motion graphics that requires like vectorized artwork in the beginning to then make all those pieces move on screen. And uh, it was definitely like a startup type of little company. Uh, so there's a lot of downtime in between jobs. So since we had so much downtime, I would you know, do some camera operations. I would do some editing. I started getting into After Effects and doing motion graphics myself, just learning because I had the time to do so. And then after a year and a half, when it became clear that it was time to break out on my own, um, I had that skill set and I took it with me. So the first job I did on my own was actually um, a video production based job. And uh, I just fell in love with um, how flexible video is. I often think of all the marketing types like vehicles, you know, like audio is kind of like a a street bike it's really nimble and it can get in places where other marketing can't like you can listen in the gym or when you're driving um the written word is ancient and powerful and it's almost like those big cargo utility army trucks you know that take cargo from point a to point b and they're reliable and trustworthy and um on down the line all the way to video and when i got to video i thought of like a hovercraft that can go on the ice or water or rocks sand doesn't matter it's just really really flexible and uh yeah, it's, it's just kind of my favorite way to, um, I always say I'm, I'm hiding the medicine in the cheese. Like when your veterinarian says your dog needs to take a pill, um, the medicine is story and I'm always hiding it in the cheese, which oftentimes happens to be video. Chocolate covered broccoli. You know, <laughs> yes, I might steal that. I'll credit you the first few times I use it, but I might steal that. All right. Well, um, how did you get your first client? Um, my first client when I struck out on my own was actually a client that I had brought into the production company that I previously worked for. Um, I hadn't done much work for them. I just introduced them to the company and they, I think they had a single video done. And when I left, I actually had a fair amount of people who, uh, found me and were like, Hey, you're not over there anymore. You're over here. Can I still work with you? And then, Hey, that's up to you. You're a, you know, 
you can spend your money wherever you want. So it was actually a client I'd already develop, developed a relationship with. And um, the, the job was actually a high school baseball team who had went to statewide finals and they were playing at a triple a ball club stadium in our state. So it was really special for everyone. Cause they were playing on a big field under the lights and all that stuff. And we shot like a highlight video of their journey to the state finals. Uh, so it's kind of fun. And uh, it, it kind of went from there um, started doing bids and, and sticking my nose in where I didn't belong and trying to help companies understand that putting out a great video is great, but telling a great story is actually impactful. And then I started getting on the radar of some universities and nonprofits and smaller local companies that were like, yeah, I think, I think we care about that. <laughs> Maybe we should talk to you instead of just making a video for the sake of it. So, I mean, the only thing I'm missing, well, I'm probably missing a lot, but the, my perception is, um, the only thing that I'm missing is the how you learn the skills. So, I mean, because most people, I would imagine, would quite like to have the skill that you have. But I, um, how did that come about? Oh, man, it's a lot of uh, yeah, growing up poor with a single parent, figuring things out. Um, my mom raised me and my brother. She's a total uh, badass. Sorry if you can't cuss. Um, and just kind of, you know, perceiving how to make life work when you don't have much. Um, the first music video we ever did for the band I was in was a no budget, just food and shelter. And we still got uh, quality actors from all over the Midwest to come in because we got really creative with what we offered them. It's just always been a version of like, I can't afford this. So I'm going to find out how to do this myself. And I don't recommend it for everyone. Um, one of the reasons I built One Minute Media, which is my company that helps uh, entrepreneurs learn how to shoot their own video, is so they don't have to learn all that stuff themselves. Because a lot of it you can skip and just have someone help you and, and get past it really fast. Uh, but it's always been out of necessity. I've been deemed by many people as resilient. Um, coming from Flint, Michigan, there's not a ton of opportunity like around you directly. So you have to kind of go and find it. And I've worked for, you know, clients all over the world and flown all over the U.S. to do, you know, content development and story development for people. And it's just always been about putting myself out there. And uh, one thing that I feel comfortable giving advice on for sure is just talking about what you're trying to accomplish. It might seem a little woo-woo, but like everywhere I go, I talk about what I'm trying to do, what's next, where I'm trying to go. And people in general, you know, the human race, but also entrepreneurs in particular are always kind of keen to help. They're always keen to keep you top of mind. And then six months later, be like, hey, are you still trying to do that thing? Because I know someone who might help. Uh, so it's just kind of a figure it out <laughs> as you go type of thing. And um, that's one of the reasons I'm so into helping entrepreneurs now is just to get them past some of those potholes and hurdles up front. Would you say it was YouTube uni University? Uh, part of it was, but this all started before YouTube was big. Um, so a lot of it was being the guy who would just go up to someone and be like, hey, how'd you do that? I mean, literally, um, that first film I was ever on was just because I was at a local networking event and mentioned that I worked at a production company, but I did the artwork. And somehow I still got brought onto a camera crew job. So like, <laughs> it's, it's weird how just, you know, putting yourself in situations, you can find that stuff. And then YouTube did finally come along and I'm a huge proponent of uh, learning. You know, you gotta be a little picky, make sure you're, you're watching a pro who knows what they're doing. But like um, the second half of my career has definitely been a lot of tutorials and questions. And then again, even digitally, DMing some of those people and saying, Hey, you know, I'm sure you get a thousand DMs a week, but like, I have this idea and I was wondering if you might be able to help me just in a quick conversation and you'd be surprised sometimes who will answer. You mentioned the, um, the Flint water crisis. I'm not up to date on that. Would you say that's concluded now? Uh, unfortunately, no, it's very slow. A lot of things in infrastructure are slow, especially in Michigan. Um, there's been a lot of pipes replaced, um, a lot of effort. A lot of love, um, heartfelt help, you know, from all over the country and the world, uh, to be honest. But it's just one of those things, digging up a bunch of pipes and replacing them with new ones for an entire city uh, is a, a slow and tough job. Um, I don't know the exact stats, but last time I looked into it, I think they were about 70% of the way done. 
and they have several companies doing it. So there is kind of a jointed effort there. Um, and then unfortunately you have lead pipes that go from where the city stops and your house begins. And a lot of people in Flint can't afford to, you know, go swap out those pipes for plastic and stuff like that. So, uh, it's a, it's a difficult, slow process and it's kind of hard to watch because, you know, we're seven years in and it's not completely fixed yet, but, um, I love talking about it at least a little bit anytime I'm, you know, like I said, welcome down to a show like yours just because um, it's not over. So I like to keep it top of mind here and there when people are interested. Yeah, it's important. Did you have the um, colored water come through to your your water supply or not? I personally did not, um, but I definitely took advantage of the uh, bottled water that they were giving out to residents um, during the crisis. Uh, because there was definitely fragrance and flavor uh, problems, <laughs> you know. Um, but just down the road, it's it's weird how Flint's kind of broken up as far as their sewer systems. But just down the road, um, you know, a mile, it was definitely happening, you know, just like that. So it was different pockets of different neighborhoods um, got, you know, different kind of results. But it was all coming from the same place, which was no good. So um, people were you know, cooking, bathing, drinking, all from bottled water. All right. Well, thanks for sharing that anyway. Yeah. Um, you mentioned about the fact that you are happy to share sort of what you're achieving at the moment so that if someone, you know, six months later can come back to you, what are you hoping to achieve at the moment? Yeah. Um, I, I have recently been told by someone that what I actually do is make the invisible visible. And it actually kind of gave me goosebumps when this person made that observation and shared that with me. And essentially what they were saying is, you know, maybe video distribution is the final leg and the one before that is the story being done. And before that is the development. But really what I excel at is pulling story out of people and, and finding what's in there and when she said you make the invisible visible, I was like, wow, that's actually kind of powerful. And that is, you know, my favorite part about everything I do um, is just finding someone who says I'm not creative or I'm not a good storyteller. I really don't have anything to share. I just run a company and it's very black and white and finding that there is some richness and story in there. Um, so my freelance work where I work directly with people um, revolves a lot around that. And then one minute media, which is the digital side is like coursework and private membership for people to learn how to shoot video on their own with our help along the way. And I love that because taking uh, small businesses, even departments within a company, or we have a client who's a, a small news organization. So all of their reporters are part of it, you know, so they're learning how to shoot video on their own and create video content, hyping up their upcoming stories and stuff like that. It's just cool to give people tools when they're already really good at what they do and watch them, you know, use them and leverage and, and get even more attention, especially when they're doing something great. Um, so One Minute Media is really important to me in that sense. And actually next week, um, so it's, uh, hopefully this is okay to say, it's near the end of June right now. So by the beginning of July, um, I'm launching what I call the Video Sandbox, which is literally just a community where people can go for free and upload video in a safe and loving environment to get critique and feedback and review so they can get comfortable on camera and get those reviews from an audience, but do it in a safe place so they don't just have to put it out to the world. Um, and that's my first kind of step in helping people to get comfortable on camera because I'm the last person in the world to say, just do it. You know, I've, I was in a band that toured and played all over the place. I've spoken in front of crowds all over the United States and I still had my own journey going from behind the camera to in front of it. Uh, so I'm never one to say, just do it, just get it over with. Um, and that's kind of my first step into uh, helping people out. So that's just um, sandbox.video and real simple to find and become a part of the community and just get your reps in and build those those video muscles. So those are kind of the three elements that I'm really focused on right now. That's cool. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Um, you did say that you're um, about giving advice, perhaps hesitant to give advice. Am, am I reading into that? Yeah. Yeah, you're you're 100 percent correct. Um, if it's if it's you know around storytelling or video, I'll let you know everything I know and feel really good about having decades behind that. But outside of that, I'm really hesitant to give advice. I love to give uh, pieces of information or little metaphors or anecdotes to get people thinking in a new way, but it's never to say, "Hey, you should go do this." 
Um, but going back to what I said earlier, a new piece of advice I finally feel comfortable giving is to, to again, talk about what it is you're trying to accomplish. It's a, it's a tactic and that's okay. Um, it's, it's something that, you know, off, off show me and you were talking about, you know, how you answer when someone says, how you doing? <laughs> and uh, sometimes even just in that quick conversation with someone, you may know who's an acquaintance. Hey, how you doing? Well, you know what? I just, uh, just got done launching this uh, sandbox video thing to help people get comfortable on camera. So I'm excited about that. The weather's nice. I'm getting some vitamin D, uh, you know, just have my favorite coffee. So I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing? It just those couple of sentences of what you're up to. Uh, not only is it intriguing and great storytelling, but again, it might, you know, just stay on someone's radar. Well, I was going to say, um, from the point of view of actually getting on camera, um, let's say someone wanted to try it and, you know, Sandbox would be a, a great place to, I don't know, test it out. But what would you say as a starting piece of advice, if you were to give advice on such a thing? Yeah. Um... Most of us, not all of us, but most of us have at least one person, someone somewhere that will shoot you straight, hopefully lovingly, especially if it's like a family member or significant other or something. But if you if you know anyone who will shoot you straight, um, a great thing to do is just use a smartphone camera and do a little 30 second blurb and show it to someone. Uh, someone you trust, obviously. I'm part of a phenomenal entrepreneurial group, uh, Slack group called the Underdogs. And it's just full of entrepreneurs all trying to get better and do their thing and grow their businesses. So it's a safe place for me to be like, hey, I'm thinking about doing a video on this topic. What do you think? Here's my thumbnail I'm going to use. What do you think? So anywhere that you can go to just get a little bit of, of feedback um, is is a really powerful thing. Uh, the other part that comes in, even though video is visual, is voice. Um, again, I've been researching this heavily over the last eight months because I want to help people. And as I ask more and more questions and more and more people, people who have been on camera for a long time, people who have just gotten on and people who aren't on camera yet, um, a lot of times they're worried about their voice. And it's completely understandable, right? Because we don't hear ourselves recorded very often. Um, I think back, I was born in the 80s. So I think back to the old, you know, answering machines. And when you hear it go off, it's like, oh, that's what I sound like. Um, and for that, I would just, you know, want to encourage people that, you know, your voice is, it's just sound waves coming out, right? So use your voice, use your knowledge, and you, you never know uh, who you might be able to impact with it. So that's some of my advice is to get started, but do it in a safe way. So you're not just putting yourself out there for ridicule. And also, I just want to encourage people that a lot of times I'm working, like I said, with people going from zero to being on camera for the first time. And a lot of them are super good. They just didn't know it, you know, so getting those reps in um, might just open a couple doors that you didn't even know were in existence. So hopefully that answers the question. <laughs> Good advice. So why the antipreneur? Yeah, so that was an accident, but I stuck with it. Um, late 2017, I was just looking at the, especially the digital entrepreneurial space. Um, a lot of gurus, a lot of like, you know, follow my blueprint and you'll have a Lamborghini too. A lot of, you know, uh, courses, which I'm not anti courses, I have my own course, but like, a lot of it was just like, coaches, coaching coaches on how to coach coaches, and you just get lost in the meta of that. And it's like, you know, just kind of garbage, um, not everything, just enough of it where I was kind of turned off by a lot of it. And I was just making a piece of content one day ranting a little bit as I do sometimes. And I was like, you know, I it used to be if you said the word entrepreneur, someone would look at you and go, Oh, you don't have a job, do you? Nowadays, everyone's calling themselves an entrepreneur. So you kind of don't know who's actually starting or running a business or who's just, you know, maybe a micro influencer, but thinks they have a company or anything in between. And it was just getting kind of irritating. And I'm one of those guys who will speak my mind. So I was like making a video and I'm like, you know, entrepreneurship is like this trendy term. Now I'm, I'm not even an entrepreneur. I'm an antipreneur. And the whole thing was just being anti shiny things, magic pills, silver bullets, all the BS that I saw on the internet. And it just got a response, you know? And so I would say it now and then in my content. And then when it came time to launch a podcast, I'm like, I'm just calling it the Antipreneur Show because people seem to like the name. I like what it stands for. And it kind of rolled from there. And now it's my personal brand and it's across all things that I do. So it's kind of fun. My one of my favorite parts of storytelling is pattern interrupt and how well it works and how you can go into something as simple as a networking meeting with a t-shirt on that says antipreneur and automatically people are either like for you against you or just generally intrigued 
And it's so powerful to just be able to interrupt the pattern of their day. And a lot of the people who are even like, I'm an entrepreneur and that says anti-preneur. Are you anti-entrepreneurship? I just smile at them and say, oh, it worked. And then they would look confused. And I would say, it's, it's just a pattern interrupt. I'm super pro entrepreneurship. I'm just anti all the BS that we don't need. And I don't know, it's just, a, it's this fun thing for me, which every once in a while, you know, people feel it has a negative connotation, but I think it's a great icebreaker and a great starting point for conversation. I agree. Although I, um, I was optimistic at the time when, I don't know whether it's necessarily stopped, but um, what you're referencing is like all the, the BS that goes on the internet for pitching. I kind of, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. But what I think is that it hasn't changed that much. What do you think about that? It hasn't. Um, I, I feel like, man, I hate to sound too dramatic here, but I feel like part of the reason that I exist and do what I do is to give more and more and more genuine business owners and entrepreneurs and people doing great things in the world who actually have empathy and would never take advantage of anyone on purpose uh, space to grow audience, to get in front of more people, to, to get on a screen and get on someone's phone and create content that might change someone's life just to combat that. Um, at the end of the day, it still turns into dollar bills. There's still uh, hopefully I don't get in trouble <laughs> too much for saying this, but there's still the Grant Cardone's of the world having their 10 X events that are sold out in packed stadiums. Um, it turns to dollar bills. People love being hyped up and they love, you know, being inspired and those things are great. Um, but they don't solve problems and they, they don't sell products and services necessarily. Um, hard work does, you know, so I, I feel like I'm combating it, but I definitely feel like it's, it's just as big as ever. And people enjoy being part of that camp and that's okay too. Like we need all kinds or else it would get boring, but, um, they enjoy being part of that camp. So since there's only, one antipreneur <laughs> currently um, there's not necessarily an army fighting against that. So uh, yeah, it's, it's still as prevalent as ever. I believe there are a couple of people um, who have become prominent. I'm not sure you, you would refer to them as antipreneurs or not, but um, anyone in that space that you like, who is, should we say doing something about it? Yeah, totally. Uh, one is Pat Flynn. Um, very heart forward. I don't know him personally, um, but he would have to do some really bad stuff for me to change my mind at this point because he's just spent so many years pouring into other people. And he's one that um, definitely practices what he preaches. And even though he does have products to buy, uh, physical and digital, so much of his stuff is free and it's really like powerful. Uh, that I'm, I'm definitely a fan of his. Um, Noah Kagan is one uh, from AppSumo. He's a, he's a bit rough around the edges and not everyone is a fan, but he really keeps it real and talks about all his failures in entrepreneurship before he finally had success. And I love that dirt under the rug type thing, you know? So that's a great space to learn how to, you know, start a business over the weekend. That's one of his favorite things to test things, you know, and see if they'll fly. Um, so those are a couple of people. Uh, who else really inspires me? I like um, Ryan Holiday. That is a bit leaning towards the guru side of things, uh, especially with some of his past books and stuff. But I like that someone's out there willing to try to bring something like stoicism to entrepreneurs, you know, because it makes sense that those things go together, but someone using a digital platform to kind of bring people into that, that mindset. You know, there is a little bit of... Uh, kind of a cult following type vibe for some of that stuff. But I just like that he's challenging the status quo, which is my favorite thing to do. So that'd probably be three people that um, are on my radar as like seemingly good doers and people saying, hey, you don't got to spend a dime in my world. I just want to encourage you to do your thing and do it well. Well, as you meant, um, um, thank you for those. Um, but uh, there are some people who are like calling out some of the um, pitch people um, are you, are you, have you heard of CoffeeZilla at all? Oh yeah. <laughs> I've, to be honest, it was like was it two months ago. Um, I had seen his thumbnails here and there, but never watched. And it was like two months ago, I finally watched something that was on crypto. Cause I'm just slightly interested in that space. And it was like, Whoa. 
and it was like a part of a three or four part thing. It ended up being going after some scammer. And then I was, I was hooked after that. So I've been <laughs> looking at his backlog over the last couple months. And the other one, um, I think he's doing good work is uh, Mike Winnett, who's got the Contrepreneur series. And basically he goes um, through, you, you mentioned the word guru. I try not to use it because people always reference it like I, I'm not your guru type thing. But um, he gets the pitch and then identifies what they're doing at that particular time and kind of makes fun of it a little bit. Oh, I think that's if, cool. I have to if people were exposed to that a bit more, I think the... Um, the pitches would be a little less successful. Yeah. 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 Think for yourself. Right. It's, it's one of those things where it's interesting because there's so many incredible leaders in the entrepreneurial space, so many incredible C suite executive folk and CEOs and small startups and all kinds of stuff that you just don't hear about because they're not in the digital space. You have no idea that company exists. It may be like here in the Midwest, a manufacturing company, but they have a great culture and they treat their people amazing. You know, and there's all kinds of cool stuff out there and great leadership, and we just don't hear about it. And because the internet's kind of built for get attention, get it fast, keep on moving, um, sometimes we get inundated with with that. So I love when anyone's trying to champion the cause. I have never backed away from challenging the status quo as being my little tagline because. Um, I get bored with what everyone's doing. So I'm always trying to do the opposite, even to my detriment once in a while. <laughs> it crush, crush the status quo, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Just, uh, you know, I, d I don't want anyone to think about it. I just want them to like, you know, obliterate, d <laughs> decimate, get rid of. Um, I, I have a thing I call the 180 approach where I look at what's going on. It may be like some marketing we're doing for an upcoming thing or just getting more people on my newsletter, or, you know, my YouTube channel, trying to entertain people while educating them and stuff. And I'll look at what's going on around me and I'll try to go 180 degrees away from what that is. And then just back that off because maybe I don't want to offend everyone, or maybe the budget doesn't allow for me being 180, or, you know, maybe that's just a little bit too intense. So let's back it off. But when you start doing your own thing so hard that no one can touch it, and you just back off a little from there to keep it like safe and palatable and stuff like that, you end up with something that's very different than what's going on. And then down the road, people are like, how did you differentiate like that? <laughs> and it could be as simple as I just zigged when they zagged. Would you say you're a bit of a contrarian? Yeah. Um, again, sometimes to my detriment, uh, often to my delight. Um, I don't like to stir the pot for the sake of controversy or anything like that. But I do like to shake things up because I feel like there's just a lot of uh, a lot of stuff out there that's just stagnant and it doesn't need to be. And so many creative, helpful, heart forward people are doing great work. And I just want to like, you know, shake them by the shoulders a little bit and be like, hey, get that out there more, you know, be a little different than everyone else in your space. So I'd say so. Did you ever get stung by, um, let's say, paying for a course, which you then regretted because it was overhyped up? So this is not a bragging point, I swear to God, but I have never bought a course in my life. And that's really weird that I have one and I'm open to saying that out loud. Um, I've never bought a course. I've, you know, it was only a little while ago and it's a different story for a different time, but it was only a, a little while ago that I actually like subscribed to anyone on YouTube. Um, not because I'm against it. It's just the algorithm does so good at giving me what I want that when I look for things, I find some of the best people and I watch their videos and then I go back to their channel and watch more. Um, but I've never like fully <laughs> bought into anything. And again, it's not bragging. It's just the way my life has went. I've always been kind of like buck the system mentality. So I'm like, now oh, what's your course have for me? Now saying that I'm also self-aware enough to know I probably missed out on some great stuff just because that was my viewpoint. Um, but I haven't, I haven't taken any. So um, what, are your, uh, what are your goals for your company? Um, I have this number and I don't even know what translates into this number, but I want to help 10,000 people tell their story. So that could be a freelance client that I work with directly, someone you know that uses one minute media to learn how to get on camera. Even if I don't do their content for them, they learned how and they made their own. Um, maybe with the uh, sandbox that video maybe you know people come in and, and find that bravery and get those reps in and start making video um, maybe someone listens to your show and is like 
all right, I've heard three different people now say I should probably tell my story, so I'm going to do it. it. Some of that's untrackable, and that's totally okay with me, but I just want to help 10,000 people um, get from zero to telling their story in some format. Cool. Do you know what you're at now? I don't, but I, the hard numbers, you know, I know I can trace around like 2,500. And that's, again, that whole gamut of people who are clients, members, people who have just commented or said that something I did impacted them or, you know, downloads on certain episodes of my podcast, stuff like that. So I feel pretty safe um, around that number, probably, of people who have created something after having interacted with me somehow. Sounds like you're going to crush that number to me. I hope, but it still seems so big to me. It's interesting, right? Like we all have our own perception of ourselves and our abilities. And even though I've done some pretty big things in my life, I still look at that. And I'm like, man, I hope I get there. But I also feel that I'm going to get there and crush it. So like, it's, it's this interesting duality I live in as a creative person. <laughs> Good. Is there anything that you think would be valuable to the audience that I haven't asked you about today? Um, oftentimes, uh, storytelling is kind of, um, this like mysterious thing to people. Uh, I like to share with people that, you know, we're, we're born storytellers, like you're born. And the first thing is, um, you know, feeding the baby, like making sure that it's fed and taken care of. And the second thing that we do is start telling stories to the baby. We, we coo at it and sing and rock it and talk to it. So we're being told story and we're developing our ability to story tell from the moment we're born. So I like to remind people of that. And oftentimes because people are thinking author, script writer, you know, something like that. When they think story, they think of like fantasy. I like to remind people that like, you know, nonfiction, your life, what you're doing, where you come from, what, where you're going um, is the kind of storytelling that people relate directly to. And I have a, uh, if it's okay to mention, I have a tool that's free for people that kind of combines the two. And it's the story spine that like Disney and Pixar use. It's just a little free guidebook people can download. And it combines that structure of filling in the blanks of kind of a story, but it's high enough level where you can fill it in with like real life stuff. Like once upon a time, I was invited to a podcast. And because of that, I shared my story. And because of that, maybe someone got a hold of me that heard your show. And ever since then, I've been working with them until, you know, one day we actually became partners in a business. I mean, you never know where that story could go. So it's just a little framework that people can uh, fill out and use to get storytelling kind of going in their mind. That's cool. I have, um, of little ones i have watched an awful lot of disney and there is certainly a formulaic approach there isn't there yeah there is and it's one of those especially with pixar uh if it's not broke don't fix it you know because at the end of the day it's a business and they're going to make money for sure um but it works right it works um you kind of can't deny how story driven we are as humans and uh yeah, it's, it's a powerful thing. And I like to be in this space because it's, it's cool that I get to use something that I didn't invent. It's been around for millennia, but it, it really helps people communicate effectively. Good. Dan, where's the best place for people to find you? Um, I think the easiest, uh, and I'll spell this out if that's okay, is I'm the antipreneur.com slash link stack, all one word. Um, so antipreneur is A-N-T-I-P-R-E-N-E-U-R, like entrepreneur only, anti. And that's got all of my, you can link to everywhere I am on the internet just from that one page. Uh, so just a cool little link stack. Um, and then the address, if it's okay to say um, in audio for that free uh, story spine guidebook is the number one. So one min, M-I-N, Mary International National. <laughs> Uh, dot media forward slash story spine and that's spine like the bones in your back um, <laughs> and i'm sure you can cut that out if you need to and if it's in the show notes that'll be perfect we can just say that it's in the show notes below as well but um yeah th those are the easiest place to find me i'm, I'm kind of everywhere so if you search antipreneur you'll probably stumble across something i've done yeah you've got your own hashtag I know, right? <laughs> right? Hopefully one day that, that uh, turns out to be something that makes me look really smart. <laughs> I think it will. All right, Dan, thank you very much for your time today. Hey, thanks for having me on. This is a blast.